Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Pete Van Leer, the Executive Director of the Cleveland Transformation Alliance and a proud City Club member. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the CEO of Teach for America, Elisa Villanueva Beard. Teach for America's mission is to enlist, develop, and mobilize as many as possible of our nation's future leaders, most promising future leaders, to grow and strengthen the movement for educational equity, equity and excellence. In Cleveland, this means not only placing teachers in both district and charter schools, but it means working with schools to train teachers and leaders, focusing on educating special education and recruiting special education teachers, coaching principals, and more. In the past 27 years, TFA has grown substantially, impacting more than 750,000 students in over 2,600 schools. Its alumni network has swelled to more than 46,000. 69% of whom work full-time in education, including my daughter's fourth grade teacher last year. What's more, core members, and also I want to say a new staff member for the Transformation Alliance. Core members serve in, often serve in majority minority schools. As of 2014, children of color con constitute a majority of uh, students in K through 12 public schools throughout the US. It's no secret that stark disparities persist in the American education system. Across the country and in Northeast Ohio, the circumstances of your birth too often predict the opportunities you have in life. Here in Cleveland, more than half of all residents under the age of 18 live in poverty. And children growing up in low-income neighborhoods tend to experience vastly different academic outcomes than those growing up in more affluent neighborhoods and suburbs. These systemic inequities disproportionately impact children of color who are almost two times more likely to be born into poverty than white children. For decades, TFA has attempted to bridge this divide, and we're here today to discuss the lessons learned in the fight for educational equity. Ms. Villanueva Beard's passion for educational equity comes from, from personal experience. She grew up in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas and developed a deep commitment to TFA's mission as a student at DePaul University where she was one of just a few Mexican-American students. Her journey with TFA started 18 years ago in Phoenix as a 1998 core member. She joined the organization's staff in 2001 to lead their work in her hometown as executive director of the Rio Grande Valley region. For the, past, for the next 12 years, she worked in various capacities before being named co-CEO in 2013. Two years later, she was named the sole CEO of TFA. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please welcome Elisa Villanueva Beard. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for that, Pete. Um, I am so glad to be here in Cleveland. I love the spirit of this city, one of resilience and determination and just inspiration. So it really is an honor to be here with you all today. So just to ground us in the challenge, um, which Pete started to talk about um, today, we have seen progress um, when it comes to educational equity for all kids, but not enough so in our country, in the most powerful nation in the world today, where you are born is the key determiner of your life outcomes. It is not your big dreams, it is not your determination, this is what drives the opportunities and access and choices kids end up having in their lives. And we also know that potential is distributed equally across all lines of difference, but the opportunity to access that potential and unleash that potential is just not. And the way we talk and assess the problem at Teach for America is there are two parts to this. 
First of all, this is a systemic problem that requires systemic solutions. And when I talk about a systemic problem, when we think about children and see children growing up in low-income communities, our most marginalized communities, they come to school with so many unmet needs. Kids don't have access to proper nutrition. They don't have access to health care. They don't have access to good housing. And then they come to schools who are just not set up to meet all of their needs and on top of ensuring that they deliver on the education that every child deserves. And so we have a dilemma as we confront how to deal with that. And then on top of that, once kids are in schools, they face even more barriers because the truth is that our system does not expect kids in low-income communities, children of color, to perform at the absolute level as their more affluent peers. We find that in low-income communities, we have low expectations of children. President Bush called it the bigotry of low expectations. Many kids in these schools do not have access to rigorous coursework, AP classes, um, and they certainly don't have the resources and the enrichment opportunities that all of our kids in this room likely have, where we are able to develop kids' passion for drama or theater or piano or athletics um, to travel, all the things that we know deeply matter to a child's development. And so I think about, personally for me, when I taught, um, I saw all of this play out, as do all of our core members and alumni. Um, as a first year teacher, I remember a few months in, maybe four or five months in, realizing when I was noticing that my kids would get headaches and I just sort of didn't really understand what was going on. And then came to find out, I got to the bottom of it, that a lot of my kids had mouthfuls of cavities. And they had not been, you know, they had never seen a dentist before, didn't know to brought brush their teeth and you know basic dental hygiene um, that we are taught early on and so it prompted me to write a grant ensure that I could educate my kids and their families to ensure that they understood how important this was and then I worked with my school administration to ensure that my kids um, got access to a dentist so that they could be able to focus and actually you know learn in the classroom and we see this over and over again in very many ways. Um, and then I, I, I will never forget when um, one of my colleagues at my school said to me, Elisa, why do you work so hard? Um, and you know, you're required to work so hard when you have to deliver for kids and you, they have all these unmet needs. Um, she said, you do realize that we are educating the future prisoners of this state, right? That is what's gonna come of this. This is six-year-olds, and this is a teacher teaching six-year-olds. Our kids are up against so much. And we've learned a lot about this over the last many, many years, but my, our own personal experience at Teach for America is rooted in, in 26 years, and I'd like to share a bit about that. Um, the first thing is that it actually doesn't have to be this way. Like, it truly just does not have to be this way. Um, we have learned what is actually possible. So it was only 20 years ago that we were having a conversation about, is it really possible for children in low-income communities, kids of color, to perform at the same rate as their more affluent peers? I mean, that was like, actually, people were having this debate. And the reason they were having this debate is because there wasn't enough data, or there weren't enough schools that were actually showing us that it was possible. There were exceptions here and there. Well, today, you all, we have hundreds of schools in America serving predominantly kids in low-income communities, probably pr predominantly kids of color, who are showing us exactly what is possible. And so the answer is yes, yes, of course this is possible. And so we no longer have that debate. The question becomes how and how fast and do we have the political will and the courage to do what needs to be done in order to deliver on the education every child deserves in this country. And as, as Pete started to say, for me, this is also deeply personal. So it's rooted in an unyielding conviction that it doesn't have to be this way. When I, I grew up in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, which is right on the Texas-Mexican border. And my mom came to the US from Mexico at the age of 17 with an eighth grade formal education. And my, father, um, my father's family's from Mexico, my dad's first generation college graduate. Well, education was so important in our family. And, um, and so we, I did everything right. Everything you're asked to do, I did. I was a top kid at my high school. I was even an all-star basketball player. Um, I still have the record at my high school, by the way. Um, <laughs> in the LeBron James flavor of a family, you know? Uh, not really, I'm just kidding. Um, but, I, you know, I was decent. Um, and, I, and so I was gonna go to college because that is what was expected in my family. 
Had I not met a mentor, I would have ended up in, in a school near South Texas. Um, but I ended up in Greencastle, Indiana, at DePauw University, which is an incredible institution. Um, but this is where my life really did change. Um, besides the cultural, you know, changes, and I was I was literally propped at propped. I was literally plopped in a completely different world. Everything was different, the cultural norms, you know, expectations, et cetera. Um, but what was hardest for me was the fact that I soon came to realize how underprepared I was for the rigors of college. So imagine being that kid who like is used to A pluses and you know, winning and, and doing well, and suddenly you are not because you have not been expected to read the kind of material that that your peers have grown up reading, um, have seminar style discussions and state your opinion with conviction and support it. And these were not things that skills that I had learned yet. Um, and the good news about all of this is I, I think athletics are just incredibly important because I learned how to be focused and disciplined and I love to win. I learned to win early on in life. Um, and that is what really drove me alongside the supports that I had. The, the, the story at the end of this is that, you know, I struggled mightily my first year of school, worked really hard for C pluses and B minuses, which was devastating to my mental and emotional, um, you know, self. But I figured it out after the first year because I built the skills that, of course, I had the capacity to build, um, but just had not been expected to do so. I ended up doing very well at DePauw after that, but it did then unleash me because I was in asking, how is it possible that this is happening to me and what is happening to all the kids were, that I grew up with in every other city, rural and, and urban community in the country. Um, and so I stay rooted in this belief that this is possible because we have just too many examples. And we've seen that, you know, in the 53,000 colleagues I have who have joined Teach for America, once you're in the classroom, you see what your kids are able to do. They actually perform when you get the supports. They get the supports they need when you expect them to. And it is just incredible. And you cannot unsee that once you see it. And those statistics we talk about and the graphs that you see don't are no longer statistics or graphs. They are people and their relationships and their possibility and their hope and that's what we root our, ourselves in as we take on this very, very hard work. So the first lesson, this is possible to solve if we decide to do it. The second lesson is that this is truly all about collective leadership. This work requires us to reach every dinner table in America. It requires a broad and diverse coalition from sectors all across the city to come together to put at the center of the work the needs of our children, the aspirations of our children and our families, and have visions that are relevant for a community and ensure that we can do our best work together. Um, I believe that it takes folks coming together across a community, region, nationally, even looking globally to make sure that we are just making the most informed decision and providing the kind of education that our children deserve and, and need in order to fully meet their potential. You know, I was at, at Teach for America in our, in our first 26 years, we focused a lot on individual, just rugged individualism. And that's, you know, part of who we are as a country. Um, we believe that, you know, when you have a will and a vision that, and a determination, you can go forth and accomplish so much. And of course, I definitely believe that. When you're doing this work that is so hard and so complex and so interdependent on so many, it requires a collective leadership. There is no way to move a very big boulder up a mountain unless there is a group of people who have decided that they're gonna do this together. Um, and one of the examples that I recently learned about that I was just so inspired by that, that just really brings this to life um, takes us to New Orleans for just one second. I was talking to my friend Kunja Naratanya, who is, works for the State Department of Education there in Louisiana. She's the chief operating officer, and there's about 30 alumni that work in that department, including the state superintendent, John White. Um, but she was a 2000 Teach for America alum, and she taught in North Carolina, in Durham, North Carolina. And she led an effort, or she played an important role in this effort, alongside many others, alumni and just uh, you know non-alumni. And they decided that one of the most important things for them to take on as a city was differentiated school funding. 
So it was an effort that was rooted in just building trust and you know, credibility over uh, years. Um, and these folks decided that we've got to prioritize this if we're really going to see transformational change and impact in our city. And so it is her personal opinion and conviction, that of the government and the, you know, and the, the districts, that they have to meet the needs of every kid. And their job is to prepare every kid to be college and career ready. And they recognize that if they're going to do this, that you have to understand that kids have different needs. And so you've got to be able to meet those needs in, in they, in, so that they can be able to, to hit that aspiration. So if we think about students with learning disabilities, significant cognitive disabilities, significant physical impairment, they need different things. And they need things that likely are just more expensive. And so these colleagues came together and they said, we're going to pursue equitable funding to make sure that our kids with greatest needs get what they need. And of course, we all know that this is a difficult, um, this is a, a difficult topic and one that is controversial in many ways. But they knew that there was no way for them to live into their goal of ensuring every kid was college and career ready without taking this on. And so they engaged deeply with the community. They had many conversations on how they might approach this. And they were successful, ultimately, in coming up with equitable formulas to um, meet the needs of all of their students. And what I find most amazing about it is that 90% of those schools voted to do this, even those that stood to lose money because they didn't serve this population of kids um, voted for it because they knew that it was their responsibility to put the kids in front and do what was right to strengthen the city because in order for us to be the most healthy economy and community and democracy all kids need to have access to this and and to me that is just an incredible example of the collective leadership that's required for us to make the kind of progress we need to see the third thing i will say is that um, we have to realize that we have optimized the public education system to date. Um, what I mean by that is this system was developed over 100 years ago for a different time in a different industry, a different expectation. We live in a 21st century global economy. It demands very different things from our kids. And schooling just must look different, must be different. Pete, you talked about the fact that you know 50% of the kids in public, in public schools today are kids of color. Um, our system was not designed to expect kids to kids of color to have job opportunities or even women to have job opportunities. And so I think one important thing that you know we are focused is on is what is the innovation that needs to happen for us to get from what the best that the system has to offer to the next level of impact in order for us to really meet the aspirations we're all seeking. Um, and the final thing that I will hit on is that leadership matters. And so it is true that there are no silver bullets. There are no easy solutions to these very complex, big, big problems. But I've come to learn that leadership is so central to making any kind of progress on this issue. And um, the kind of leadership that is you know, creative and innovative and has visionaries. And I often just you know, reflect a lot on the fact that when we're trying to solve our biggest problems, you just put the best talent on it. And you say, well, let's make sure that we have everyone on the case that needs to be on the case in order to succeed. Um, and as I've been talk thinking a lot about JFK's 100th birthday that was just celebrated, I was thinking about him as a leader and the visionary that he was. And you know, he inspired our nation and, and really the world with his words when he said, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And he is a model of the leadership and the determination to accomplish something that had never been accomplished in humankind, that to accomplish something that many said was actually not possible. And of course, he could not do this alone. Um, he had a difficult task to accomplish. And so while we know that the astronauts were the most visible, they were also backed by some of the most innovative and award-winning scientists, mathematicians, elected officials, and many more. It took intense collaboration, creativity, and just true collective leadership to be able to put someone on the moon. And there were so many systems, and there were so many moving parts to all of it, and every variable 
mattered. A simple, a simple calculation, a measure of heat resistance, an estimation of wind speed would mean that it just would not happen. But he proved that it was possible and they put somebody on the moon. When I think about this, and not only did they put something on the moon, they emboldened the next generation of leaders to think about what is possible. What do we reject as just commonplace and say we should challenge the status quo, the conventional wisdom, and go after something that's really hard? And personally, that's how I think about educational equity and excellence. We've never figured it out, but I know it's going to take fierce leadership for us to be able to make the kind of progress and transformational progress that we need to see. And I take inspiration from many places when I think about progress, because there has been progress that really has mattered for our country. And when I think about the nation's capital, I was recently talking to a good friend, Kaya Henderson, who is the former chancellor um, of DC Public Schools, and we were reflecting on the DC system. I mean, just 15 or 20 years ago, everyone would be talking about this system as the most, one of the most troubled in our countries that this, I mean, literally, it is, there's no chance to repair this. Everyone should just go home and call it a day. Everyone was moving from the city as fast as they could, as soon as they could get an opportunity or, you know, find a family member to leave because there literally was not one school serving kids of color and kids from low-income communities that was doing justice to what kids deserve. And today, according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or what we call our nation's report card, DC is amongst the fastest improving systems in our country. And it has been, it has taken time and persistence to do that. And there are many factors that have played into this, but Teach for America that's been there for you know, 25 years has been an important factor in that success. And I'll illustrate this for just a second. Um, over the past decade, the Chancellor of Schools has been a TFA alum. There's been two. Um, when you look at the Superintendent of Education, the former and, and current, it, they're Teach for America alumni, 15% of the principals in that system are Teach for America alumni today. Um, there are hundreds of core members and alumni in that system. And in the last seven years, the past six Teachers of the Year have been Teach for America alumni. Many others are, have started nonprofits. They're supporting the schools so that they get all, the, all that they need, um, doing parent engagement work, just really inspiring stuff. And I say all the, of this to say that, of course, single, you know, TFA did not single-handedly do this, but, but I do say with confidence that if we remove the leadership and the energy of Teach for America, you would certainly have a different story. But the main point of this is that this took a city of leaders that came together and persisted and kept at it. And it's, it's all about the collective effort to decide that we are going to keep doing this. And, and just a, a beautiful example of what is possible when you get on the path. I will not, DC Public Schools has a lot of room to go and they are, you know, still moving. But the fact that you can get the engine going and start and be one of the fastest improving systems in America is, is pretty incredible given just where they were 10 years ago. Um, so I believe that with educational equity and excellence, we're trying to get to the moon. And it's going to take that kind of leadership and commitment from um, not only those in education, but the business community, all of those a city to come together and, and do all of this. And I do believe that together we can get to the moon. And so um, I will leave you by saying, you know, I, I have learned that this work just does not get any easier. Um, it takes just us having the urgency of today, but also having always a long-term view. Um, and I've started to believe that those with the most stamina will come out at the end of this. And if there's one thing I know, Cleveland has lots of stamina. So um, thank you. <laughs> I look forward to the discussion. Are you, do I I'm gonna step in here? All right. So today we're enjoying a Friday forum with Elisa Villanueva Beard, CEO of Teach for America. We're about to be begin the audience Q&A. So we welcome questions from everyone, city club members, guests, students, or those of you getting, uh, joining us for, uh, on our radio broadcast or webcast or live simulcast at the Parma Snow Branch Library of the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County Public Library. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator, Teddy Eisenberg, 
and um, marketing outreach coordinator Faye Walker. May we have the first question, please? Uh, yes, please tell us how Teach for America members react with uh, in the classrooms. How do how do they work with uh, regular teachers? And uh, also, have you had any what's what's the relationship with the teachers' unions? All right. Um, so our teachers are trained to, you know, we are recruiting high achievers, the people with strong track records who just have a drive to make a difference, um, you know, who just say, I want to change the world, and that's sort of the attitude. We, they, are, they are signing up to, be, to do the hardest thing that they will ever do, and we are very clear about that. And so not only is it making a meaningful impact with kids, but it truly is transformational for the teacher themselves. And in our training, our training model is called Teaching as Leadership, and that's how we approach and train our teachers to think about the classroom and the, the capacity and capabilities we build are around leadership. Um, one of our you know, core values is to do this work courageously and boldly and to pursue equity, but to do it with incredible humility. Um, this work is really hard and complex, and of course we know that many people have been working on this issue long before Teach for America ever showed up. Um, and we have more questions than answers, and when we start to think we have more answers um, than questions, we get in trouble. And so we, we really do work to train our teachers to you know, focus on their kids, be the best, and also to build the team and be the leader that they need to be with across you know, an entire campus, because it's not about just your classroom. I mean, if your classroom is doing great, that's really important because that's your job as a teacher. But it's insufficient if the rest of the campus doesn't get to, you know, learn from each other and, and you learn from others. I mean, I know for, for me, um, my mentor teacher was a 20-year teacher at Bethune Elementary School where I taught and I leaned on her. And so we definitely work really hard to ensure that our, our core members are learning from the great wealth of knowledge and experience and wisdom of the, you know, teachers that we work with on, on a school which are, are mostly non-Teach for America core members. Um, and I find that our teachers do a pretty good job of integrating themselves and, and behaving in the ways that we would all um, hope. Um, in terms of the relationships with the teacher unions, there, there are national unions and there are local um, unions, and so they vary um, across the board. I would say that on average, you know, as I said earlier, we believe that we need diverse coalitions and people that are working together to find the common ground to you know, make the progress necessary. Um, there are sometimes there is dissonance um, in the relationship on certain aspects, but we work really hard to make sure that we are focused on the positive and the things that make sense to do work together. Um, and, um, and, and so nationally, I would say we have a strong relationship with one union and another union, I would say that it's not as healthy, um, but we continue to work to figure out how to, how to find the common ground because at the end of the day, we are all in this together and trying to just make sure we are providing the education that our children deserve. Uh, how you doing? My name is William. Hi, William. I'm a junior at MC2 High School, and I just have a, a question. Yes. Um, Due to cut, uh, budget cuts, well, our, our government teacher was released at the beginning of the school year, mm -hmm. which was last August, so we did not have a government class to take. And we took a, um, a Ohio State graduation test to graduate high school, and we took a government test mm -hmm. that we like knew nothing about. So I'm pretty sure the majority of the school probably didn't do so well on the test unless you had previous history on government, which a lot of us didn't. So I just want, like, what's the next step here? Like, what should we do? Like, is it? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's unjust is what I would say. And I would say that sadly, this situation is not an exception when we look at our schools that we work in, in urban and rural America. I will say for myself, um, our, when I taught, I taught first and second grade bilingual education, we had a permanent sub. My, my kids went into a permanent sub every single year that I was there at my school for three years. Um, and so what I say to that is I'm sorry because us adults didn't get it together enough for you to give you the, the education that you deserve. Um, and, and know that this room full of people are just so committed to, 
to changing that and wanting to make sure that you're able to get what you need, the skills and capacity, so that you can do whatever you want to do in your life. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, you say to yourself that uh, public education was meant for 100 years ago. Yes. Now, what is Teach for America going to do? Because you, you have a lot of kids uh, who have been damaged in the public system. Are you taking care of those kids, or are you just starting afresh? Because you know, there's a whole bunch of people, like the gentleman that just spoke, yes. that didn't know that such an exam existed. Sure. Yeah, and yet, these are the people that are going to be left behind, really, right. in the new educational system and in the Teach for America. Yeah. Um, so what I would say is we clearly have a system that exists today. And what we're pushing ourselves on at Teach for America is saying as we train and support our next cohort of leaders is that we are orienting them towards innovation and big thinking and really getting people to grapple with how do we think about you know, truly a transformational system? Of course, they're going into classrooms that exist today in our public, traditional public schools. Um, and we need to work alongside everybody else. I don't believe in like, oh, just you know, go blow up the system and you know, what, that makes no sense. There are children who need to be educated today in our schools. Um, but I, I, I say it because as we're thinking about what are the next you know, sets of changes we need to do and incremental things or tweaking on the edges is just really insufficient. Um, and we have, we have schools doing great work in the city. Um, and I think we need to continue to make sure that, you know, w there are schools that are sending kids from low-income communities, you know, 50% of them are going to and through college by the age of 25. That is compared to, on average, kids growing up in low-income communities are going to and through college one in, at a one in nine rate. And so that is transformational for children. And so we should not, I would argue, we should not stop doing that. But as we think about improvement and how to get to the next level of, you know, of change and what's needed for our kids to be competitive in a 21st century economy, I do think we need to think boldly and creatively about what that is going to take. And so as new schools are being started, it's not about, you know, it's taking the very best that we've learned and just learning quickly and thinking big about what's possible, which in fact, a lot of people are trying. It's a big topic nationally and lots of various folks are doing very interesting things. How do you incorporate technology? What is personalized learning? Um, what do schools even look like? You know, do you sit in classrooms or not? If you're familiar with Montessori, a lot of flavor of that sort of thing, but applying it to you know, everyday world and, and real life that creates independence and self-motivation. And um, it's, it's really remarkable. So that's just more of what I mean. But we got to do this together and push ourselves to, to really reimagine what is necessary if we're going to get to where we need to go. Hi. Um, tagging on to this morning, you mentioned a radically disruptive <clears throat> and new system, kind of innovative system needs to take hold because we've optimized yes. about as well as we can with the current model. Can you unpack that a little more as far as where we might start with that? Because I think there's a realization now that that's a need, that yeah. we need to, I call it in the, I'm in the tech business, I call it hitting the reset button a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you could share where we might start with that or, or maybe a little bit more of how it could evolve, you know, with a, a discipline and a focus to, yep. to get us there. Yeah. Well, you know, there are some schools that are actually doing this kind of work. And so I would point to a school that has really left an impression on me in the Bay Area called Summit Public Schools. Um, and what they have done is, I mean, I, I they, they, serve middle and high school kids. And they, they do it through personalized learning. And so it's first rooting ourselves in the skills and capacities we need to build in kids. 
A, kids need to um, be self-driven. We need to like really nurture the entrepreneurial spirit and the creativity of our kids. They need to learn computation and coding, just the things that we just know as we think about the jobs that are gonna be even relevant in the next 20 years. And sitting in desks and learning, hearing from a teacher is just not what's building the capacity that our kids need. Um, and they need to ultimately, obviously, be just self-driven and wanting to do this. So at Summit, for example, they have this um, self-pacing curriculum. They have teachers. I, I believe every, no matter in the future models that everyone creates, there will, there, there will always be a need for teachers. I think teachers might play a very different role um, and be more of coaches and facilitators. And, and when we optimize you know, the use of technology, which is not a silver bullet and you know, it can only just do so much. But at Summit, for example, um, kids literally are self-pacing and you know, they get small group time with teachers and then they go and they do work on their own. They do group work independently. They do, self they do these assessments that tracks where they are in the school year. They're getting coached by their by their teacher, and it's really, it is pretty transformational. They don't, they don't have a, a rooms, they have like open spaces, and it's lots of just collaborative work. Um, it's really powerful, and you know, Transcend Education is a new pro nonprofit that's working with schools to try to reimagine this and, and really think together and co-create what are all the things we've learned that we know are critically important and how to get to the academic skills, but also how to get to those broader skills that we know kids need their own personal character development, their need to build their own confidence, et cetera. All of these things matter. Um, and so schools are reimagining how do we bring all that together. And so there's lots of, lots of good stuff happening across. And I just think we need to better codify it so people have access to it. And I think it's a good starting point, at least for us to, to think through how we, how we get to the next level. question regarding parents and grandparents is that do you have a plank dealing with parents teaching parents and grandparents the importance of education like you pointed out your family you couldn't fool around in your family you're gonna study yes, well sir. if we had that message in with parents and grandparents wouldn't we do much better as a nation yeah I, I, what I see is kid comes home kid comes to school not no stimulus from the parents not enough food he's a setup for failure but if he has even with poverty even with poverty, if you have parents saying, you're going to study, you're going to learn, I'm going to help you, or grandma will help you, that would help a great deal. Yes. Shouldn't that be important, or, or am I wrong? I think, it's, I, think, I think it's really important. I think we haven't always made it easy for parents and grandparents to have access to schools, to feel comfortable in schools. Um, and frankly, a lot of our own parents haven't been through the education system and so aren't equipped to just even know what is the best thing to be doing? And so I definitely think we have a responsibility. You know, at, at Teach for America, we definitely focus our teachers on understanding the importance of this. I remember in my first year of teaching, um, I, I was, you know, I, I knew this mattered a lot. And so I got to know my students and my families. I would, you know, show up to their houses for birthdays and Saturdays, Sundays. Whenever they could meet with me, I would go to them. Um, but there was this one parent who, never, her, her kid was just truant, and I could not get her to help me, or, you know, she wouldn't meet with me, she wouldn't follow through, and I remember talking to the, the counselor at the school, and, and I said, you know, something like, you know, Mr. Gooding, I care more for this kid than this mom does, and he put me in my place in two seconds. Um, <laughs> this 22-year-old, as it turns out, had no clue what she was saying. Um, and you know, he sat me down and said, you better understand one thing and one thing alone. I don't care what you think about the parents. They are the most important thing that this child has. And you are a temporary thing here. You, are, you have this child for one year. And the most important thing you can do is figure out how do you engage that parent because they will matter the most to this kid for the rest of their life. And so I was like, okay. I mean, I got on a mission and, you know, she and I became, actually, she had a really hard life. This woman really had so much that she, you know, so many pressures and she didn't always know how to channel that. Um, but we figured out a way to find common ground and Carlos showed up to school and we had agreements. and. 
you know, and, and we have to really be serious about parent engagement. And as it turns out, parents deeply love their kids more than any of us, right? <laughs> um, and they want to do what's right for their kids. And it's just a matter of having the tools and the know-how. Um, and, and so there are lots of organizations focused on this. I think it's, it's critically important. And when we do see parents engage, it truly does change the calculation of what's possible. Hi, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a 2006 Eastern North Carolina Corps member. Hey. Um, I'm here with a, a couple of our students and staff at, from St. Martin de Porres High School. Uh, we have a corporate work study model where uh, Sincere goes to work one day a week with the Cleveland Indians and uh, Clifford works for the YWCA here in Cleveland. Uh, we're on our way over to the City Club and passed by a couple of kids on the street that were at lunch from their corporate work study office. Um, our kids have this corporate work study experience which is really phenomenal um some of them from that corporate work study experience want to want to do something that is going to make a lot of money uh some, something that's going to be uh help society in some way and some of them come back and say you know i, I even maybe want to be a teacher but i th there's a lot of of press out there uh talking about how teaching is so hard and it doesn't pay a whole lot uh, what's your message to a high school kid who's thinking, I see these inspiring people in front of me, but I don't know? <laughs> I mean, so this is one of the core challenges we have at Teach for America at the moment, and the country has, truly. You know, schools of education are, you know, are having trouble enrolling kids to study education to be teachers um, for all of the reasons and in the morale of teachers has never been worse I don't think for I don't know 50 years or something than it is right now um, we have not done a good job of supporting our teachers through a lot of change that this country has gone through over the years and and I I'm, I'm supportive of some of the changes that have you know just created more transparency and accountability, but you cannot do that absent real support and professional development and, and a, a camaraderie around, we've got you, you've got us, you're part of this, let's do this together. Um, but what I, would, what I say to college students today was we're recruiting them, trying to inspire them to, to come and join us at Teach for America. And others, I, would, I mean, there's no more precious natural resource that we have in our country than our students. Our students need to be not only academically prepared, but need to learn about empathy and, you know, and, and difference and appreciate diversity and all of these things that just really matter. And there is no greater impact you can make than being with young people and teaching them. And it's, it's, it's the most rewarding thing, as we all know. But it is hard. It is a hard profession to stick with. And, um, and we see that. And so, I think come and teach and then demand to be part of the changes, the policy changes that need to happen in our federal government and our states. And really the, the change is in the state. I mean, that is where the power is. Um, and so I think we need our most brilliant minds teaching. And so I encourage people to, to go for it. Um, and, but, it but it doesn't come without the challenges that you are describing. Um, but hopefully people will look at you and say, it's worth doing. Hello. First, Hi. thank you so much for being here and um, having such words of encouragement and, and hope. Um, my question to you is you've talked about utilizing the community. You've talked about um, using different forms in the classroom for higher level thinking and discussions. You've talked about helping uh, young people to have the health care that they need and then working with parent engagement. My question to you is how or if um, Teach for America is working to train your staff on trauma-informed practices so that the students can access their um, higher level brain functions to be able yes. to do some of the things that you've talked about. Yes. Um, this is so critical and we are, we are doing more of this. I'm, I'm, it's very, it's one of the hardest lessons we've learned is that we didn't focus fast enough on this that deeply matters in our kids have seen and gone through so much trauma by the age of six um, and we somehow think they can you know just 
not have that affect them when they're in their classroom. And um, when we see discipline, discipline, discipline problems, you know, as a teacher, you sort of react as like, oh, this kid is just so disrespectful and has no control of self. Well, when a kid has gone through so much and has never had the opportunity to process that and learn how to deal with, you know, um, tough, you know, tough situations that could be, that create dissonance or conflict and are not sure how to be, um, it is because they need help um, on how to build those capabilities and capacity. And so I think this is one of the places that we have learned a lot um, and, and probably needed to have figured this out many, many, many years ago, but are very focused on this part of how do we help our teachers and, and help our teachers also with their own self and care, um, which we haven't been good about either for, for many years. But the truth is that our teachers are themselves going through their own trauma as they, you know, sort of at 22 are in these really tough, not, that are very tough environments where they themselves have, have lots of pressure and they have to deliver on kids and that's your first, you know, promise and, and commitment. Um, but you have a lot of processing to do too. And so how do you support a teacher to be the most effective with their kids and able to get your kids to do that too? And so we're, we've turned our attention to this and are trying to figure out how do we um, incorporate that in all of our training and support, have some pilots going on at the moment and, and are trying to figure out what's the best way to do this, but there may be multiple ways to do this. And we, that's sort of the approach that we've taken at the moment. Thank you. Hi. Hi, welcome to our championship city. Thank Last you, I know, a it's a beautiful it's place. We'll be back. I'm um, John, I'm with Breakthrough Schools and just wanna thank you for uh, bringing TFA here for the last five years. As you know, we've hired dozens and dozens of your <laughs> teachers. My question is this, I'm wondering now that you have five years here, is, do you have any data that show maybe, do, do the TFAers do better and are happier in any kind of particular environment? In other words, you, you have K through eights, you got nine through 12s, you got charters, you got district, you got uh, teachers get a lot of coaching from administrators, others don't, two teacher model, one teacher model. Is there any like, this is like the perfect fit or something, or is it just random and they, here they're great Here in Cleveland, everywhere? you're asking specifically. I'm sorry. You're asking about here in Cleveland. Well, I'd love to know Cleveland, but if you have data that's that you don't have Cleveland and you have I can well, I'm sure Holly has data that is yeah. Cleveland, and I she would be much more equipped to talk about that accurately than I am. Um, but I, I will say, uh, nationally, what we have found, um, where we've been placing, and you know, about a third of our core members across the country teach in public charter schools, and then the rest are in traditional public schools. Um, we actually find in terms of data and performance, um, you know, in the charter schools, you usually have just a, a, um, a certain culture that expects a certain rigor and, you know, level of teaching um, that is, you know, necessary for, for us to ensure that we're doing what we need to for kids. And so you do see that teachers are held to just a very high bar. Um, and have to deliver on results, and if they don't, then you know they're in trouble. Um, and so we we do see that, but we also do see at the traditional public schools um, our kid our, our core members doing incredible work and able to make remarkable gains because at the end in every school there's just you know there's always people working to to be their best and do their best and 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 be able to see the gains. So on average, what I would say nationally is we don't see these huge differences. How teachers feel in terms of their support definitely varies, um, and, but it, it also plays out differently because we find that our core members, uh, it, it, and I'm talking generalizations here obviously, um, at, at the high performing charters feel just so much pressure. I would say they're the ones that are just like sweating and, and have lots of anxiety. Um, and, and then the, those in traditional public schools also feel, you know, put a lot of pressure on themselves, but it's less coming from you know, someone's in your classroom every day giving you feedback, observing. I mean, I think our teachers would love that. Um, and so it's just a different kind of pressure. And But on average, we see that, you know, people are performing well. Holly, I don't, I guess, I don't know what's appropriate, but maybe you can follow up afterward and <laughs> share. Okay, or, or now? That's fine. Okay. Uh, Madeline has a question on Twitter. Okay. She'd like to know what mistakes uh, would you say Teach for America has made over the years and what has the organization learned and or changed in response to those? Okay. Um, so I would say one of our big, I, I would, I guess, two things quickly popped into my mind. Um, one is when we back in the early 2000s, um, 
we were really trying to figure out how do we measure success in the classroom um, and really believe that data is important and accountability is really important. Um, and so we were fiercely focused on figuring out how do you how do you get how do you measure what you're teaching students and what they're learning and we're very focused on the academic outcomes for kids which is hugely important as everybody in this room knows um, i would say that we were overly focused on that for probably too long what you come to learn is that it's really incredible and important for a kid to make you know, 1.5, two great levels of growth in reading. I mean, we want that in every classroom, but it's, it's insufficient. If you're also not building their own, you know, confidence and their own character and their own belief in what's possible, and when you're not <laughs> ensuring that they're independently learning these skills, because when they go to the next classroom, they need to be able to do that. You're not gonna be there for them. And so we had not gotten ahead of that quickly enough. And so I think we were too overdialed on just the academic gains. And what we started to realize as we would visit classrooms, we were like, you know, this is like a very structured classroom and they're, they're on a mission for sure and it's very urgent. But kids felt more like robots and on timers and you know, like getting to the next thing and it just didn't feel joyous and like you know how 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 classes should feel that are filled with love and there's you you feel the relationship between a, a teacher and, and its students um and so we quickly changed you know and evolved and and now we talk about broader outcomes we're still challenged to figure out how do you measure that because we believe we need to measure what we're doing to see if it's effective and there's different things that people are trying and so we're trying things like student surveys that seem to correlate with academic outcomes as well, as well as focusing on academic outcomes. So the field is trying to figure this out across the board, um, but that's one big thing that comes to mind. The second thing I will say is um, we have evolved, and, and all of these lessons, just one thing to say is, of course, we all just do our best with what information we have. And I think the most important thing is that we are committed to continuously improving, which we do have a very strong in our DNA is, is that because then otherwise you're just scared to do anything because it's so hard and you're probably wrong half the time and you just got to be able to know if you're wrong and change quickly. But the, the second thing I would say is um, we today, you know, 50 percent of our core are um, core teachers of color. Um, we are the largest, most diverse, you know, intervent or, or we provide the most educators for, for kids across America um, at, the, at the largest scale. And um, we were not always this diverse. We've always focused on diversity, though. But the thing that if I had to go back 15 years that I wish we would have figured out is like you just have to intentionally actually work on ensuring that all of your teachers um, know how to work across lines of difference. There is a lot of identity work that needs to happen in order for us to be cu culturally responsive, to be culturally competent enough to ensure that we are doing this work responsibly. Um, and we didn't always do that. We need people, we've learned that, you know, it doesn't matter what your background is, you, we need you in this work and you can be successful. But, and, and no matter whether you're me who grew up in the Rio Grande Valley, I too, everybody needs to be reflecting on their own identity and how they best contribute and how you work with a community that's just different. Um, and, and even when you grew up there, it's just different once you have a college degree and you are very privileged. Um, I'm a very privileged person, <laughs> no matter my background. And, and we all have to grapple with that to be most effective in the classroom. Um, we are very focused on this now, but I would say that um, if I had to go back, we would learn that quicker and do something about it more quickly. Uh, <clears throat> uh, how y'all doing? My name is Ananias. Um, I just had a question. Um, how big of an effort are y'all putting into getting the word out to low-income schools who don't know about the opportunities that y'all offer? Yeah, well, um, we work with the community. So here in Cleveland, Holly works with, you know, our, our districts here, starting with Cleveland. And, and, um, and so we work with the superintendents and the principals to make sure that we can build partnerships. And at the end, we want our principals to, to have a robust pipeline of teachers to pick from. And that is our big goal. We believe that we, our, our principals know best on who they should hire and that we would love to be one, one option for folks to consider. And so um, we try to spread the word as it makes sense, but mostly it's, it's with the partnerships that we've built with principals and superintendents over time and our charter partners, of course, as well. Done.
Thank you. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a Friday forum with Elisa Villanueva Beard, CEO of Teach for America. Ms. Villanueva Beard appears as part of our series on education innovation, sponsored by Nordson. We're delighted to have Nordson here today and appreciate your continued support of our educational programming. Today's forum is also the Nelson E. Weiss Memorial Forum, made possible by a generous gift from McDonald Hopkins, Burke, and Haver LLP, and the friends of Nelson E. Weiss. We have many of the Weiss family here today and friends with us today, and we appreciate your generosity and continued support of the City Club. Community partners for today's forum are the Cleveland Transformation Alliance, Positive Education Program, and Teach for America Cleveland. And this program is actually part of the celebration of TFA's fifth anniversary here in Cleveland. Additionally, we welcome guests hosted by Cleveland Education Compact, the Cleveland Foundation, College Now Greater Cleveland, and the Teach for America Advisory Board. Lastly, we welcome students from MC Squared STEM High School and St. Martin de Porres High School. Student participation in the City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the William E. Weiss Foundation. We thank you all for being here today. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Ms. Villanueva Beard. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on Ideastream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.